This is lesson 11 on Joel. This is Two Foot Dilemma. Well, good evening, everyone. Glad you could join us here for another session with the Two Foot Dilemma. Tonight, we're looking at the uh, minor prophet Joel. And at first blush, somebody might say, well, what does Joel have to do with us? Isn't Joel all about a prophecy that has to do with Israel? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Joel's prophecy was directed particularly at Judah, but included all of Israel in a sense. But it actually has a powerful message for us, even though <clears throat> we're in a different age and we're not in Israel. We that are in the church still can prosper from what's being said here. So let's get into it. Years ago, I attended a homeschool convention and I went to a breakout session where there was a guy who was uh, offering some insights as to how you would teach the Bible uh, in a biology class. Or to put it another way, how can you teach biology using the Bible? I thought, wow, that sounds interesting. So I went to the session and actually really enjoyed it. Here's where he went, and I thought it was really interesting. He said <clears throat> he was a biology teacher, and he said he really enjoyed doing dissections. And one of the animals which his class did every year was a grasshopper or a locust. And he said, what can you learn about a locust or a grasshopper by doing dissections? Well, you can learn about the carapace, you can learn about the, uh, the breathing apparatus of the insect, how many legs they have, how they hop, and uh, so on and so forth. And he went through the whole thing. It was really interesting. And, uh, but he said, well, let me ask you, is that all we know about locusts and grasshoppers? And everybody probably sat there and thought, yeah, that's about all we need. And he said, well, let's take it a step further. Actually, the biology book only tells us a small portion about it locusts. The fact is that locusts <clears throat> are even more interesting to us than many other animals because the Bible speaks directly to them. So let me read a verse. And this is the verse he used. This comes from Proverbs chapter 30, verse 27. He said, that verse says, locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. Let me read it again. Locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. In other words, the picture you get out of the book of Proverbs is locusts are moving according to some program. They move in ranks. Now, we may look in the sky and say, whoa, it doesn't look like there are any ranks. There's not a column going in this direction and a column. Going. But actually, those locusts are being moved even though they have no king that is a locust king, they're being moved to do whatever it is they do. So here's the point. Yeah, it's interesting to study the physical structure of a locust, get into the organs and all that, but it turns out that locusts are extremely important to God. He uses locusts for his own purposes. Can you think of a place other than Joel in the Bible where God used locusts for a purpose? The plagues. Okay, the plagues in Egypt. The locusts were brought in. Who brought them in? Uh, well, how do they know to go to Egypt? They don't have a king. And the wind took them. <laughs> okay, th there are all kinds of natural explanations. Oh, well, it was a westerly wind blew that blew them off the Libyan Sahara into Egypt, and so on and so forth. But the truth of the matter is, God brought them in. Now, when we look at the Book of Joel, he's talking about four different kinds of locusts that have entered the land of Judah in particular. And those, those locusts have come in to do something, to decimate the agriculture of the Jewish people at that time. And what we want to do is to look closely at what that's all about. Why is God sending locusts to his chosen people? Why would God be at the front ranks of the movement of these insects to come in and decimate the vineyards, the olive yards, the grain production, and so on. Trees, everything would have been destroyed. Why would God be a part of that? 
And then secondly, in chapter 2, it tells us that God is leading an army of men into the land of Israel. So here's God. He's unseen. We look at the verse that says, the locusts have no king, yet they all advance in ranks. Doesn't look like the locusts have a king. Can't see a locust king or a locust general. But it turns out God is the locust king. God is the one who moves the locusts to fulfill his purposes. Okay, well, why were there locusts? Why is Joel talking about locusts? Well, there actually were. They came in the land of Judah and just decimated everything. And um, so the question might be asked, well, why is God sending these locusts in there? Why is he directing them to come in? Why is it his purpose that these locusts come in and do so much damage? That's what we want to investigate. And I, I would just like to say in passing, I think it's five times this expression, the day of the Lord, is mentioned in the book of Joel. So the theme of this book is the day of the Lord. And we're going to get into it. What, what is that all about? Uh, is that a time period? Uh, when does it occur? Are there several aspects to the day of the Lord that we need to know about? We'll get into that. But right now, <clears throat> these locusts are part of what God would say is a forthcoming day of the Lord. Okay, so why does Israel have a locust problem? Well, it's very simple. They had a continual poor relationship with God. It wasn't God's fault. God went out of his way to benefit, bless, and enjoy company with the Israelites, but they had a problem with Jehovah. Can you imagine, because we looked at this before, what is the first step in the problem that the Jews had with Jehovah? It was a downfall, a moral downfall. But if we look at that downfall, there were steps. What was the first step in Israel's decline in relationship to Jehovah? Unbelief. Okay, so unbelief set in. What was it they didn't believe? Any book you read in the Old Testament, Israel, God is willing to point out the failures of Israel, and it's usually initially starting with unbelief. But what would they not have believed that was the starting point of their downfall? That God was their king? Okay, the biggie is God is king. Interesting because we're studying the two kingdoms, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. They had a problem. They didn't believe God was the king. If they didn't believe God was the king, who did they believe was the king? What is our factory default setting? Us. Us. Self. Okay, so part of their unbelief was, hey, we don't believe God is king. In fact, they might not even believed God existed. Now, they would use his name. They had a lot of religious feasts, festivals, and uh, processes they went through on a regular basis. They would speak of God. And if you listen to him, say, well, they know God exists. But perhaps they didn't. If they didn't believe he existed, then they wouldn't believe he was the king. And if they don't believe he's the king, then the next thing falls in place. And what's that? Idolatry. Idolatry. You get into unbelief, the next thing is idolatry. Now, I think that idolatry flows out of, well, God doesn't exist. If he really existed, he wouldn't let us go through all these problems. If he really existed, when we prayed, keep the Assyrians off our soil, he would have taken the Assyrians off the soil, but he didn't do it. So if God, in their mind, is not doing what they think God should do for them, every human being needs a God. If it is not going to be Jehovah God, they're going to make up one. That's interesting that <clears throat> neighboring nations have the Baals and so on. So they flip-flop from 
a healthy belief in God to now trusting in false gods. That leads naturally to what? If you start with unbelief, get into idolatry, what comes next? Immorality. Immorality, lawlessness. Now, this is kind of an interesting word because law is exactly what kings are all about. The kings say, hey, I'm the king, and I established the laws. And for Jehovah, it was, I am your king. I love you. You're my chosen people. I've given you these laws to bless you. But if you don't believe that I'm the king and that I exist and you're serving other gods, then you will fall into a condition where you're not obeying my law, but you obey, obey the law of a fallen man. And the law of fallenness is, I am autonomous. I'm a law unto myself. And that's exactly where Israel went. Okay. <clears throat> well, what comes next? God watches, hey, they're in unbelief. Now they're turning to the Baals and other false gods. Whoa! Bloodshed on the streets. Uh, all kinds of mistreating of orphans and, and widows and so on. What comes next? Judgment. God has called out a separated people to himself. And lawless people can't fulfill his desire for a holy nation. So God is saying, look, I've reached a point. My patience has been tried to the full, and now judgment will fall. And that's what we want to look at. All this essentially points to this historical uh, expression, the day of the Lord. It actually is going to be fulfilled in the future. But we're going to see that the day of the Lord has implications all the way through, especially starting here with Joel. Okay, now here's the here's the, the situation. God loved Israel. He loved Israel. He called them out from Ur of the Chaldees, if you will, through Abraham. He gave them the promised land, beautiful place. Uh, promised that they would be a nation that produced many kings. Now this is interesting because the kingdom of man has a lot of kings that came out of the Abrahamic line, as well as the king, Jesus Christ, who will rule the earth in the latter days during the millennial kingdom. So Israel is loved by God. Now, if you love something, if you call it your possession, what do you do with it? If you have something you love, and it's valuable, what do you do with it? Protect it. You protect it. What if it what if it starts to corrupt? You know, it could be a beautiful brooch made of some expensive metal and it's beginning to corrupt. What would you do if you really love that piece of jewelry? Clean it up. You get it cleaned up. You wouldn't throw it away. And God did not throw away Israel. So God loved Israel. And this judgment, I would like to suggest, is really coming under what we would think of as chastening. It isn't judgment unto condemning them to eternity in hell, but it is a harsh, harsh judgment. And it's called chastening. Now, what has this got to do with us as Christians? Well, before we move on, can a Christian sometimes fall into unbelief? Can we ever get so discouraging? Where are you? Got to keep praying. You don't answer my prayer. Look at the trouble that's around me, and you don't change it. Where are you? It is very easy for us to fall into a state of unbelief. But the minute we do, we need to have something to bolster our confidence. If we don't believe that God is our king, we're going to turn to something else. So just briefly, what are some things, what are some false gods that we in this church age 
turn to when unbelief sets in. When we begin to say, I don't have to keep God's laws. I can do what I want. Science? We can turn to science. Science has the answers. What else do we turn to? Money. Pardon? Money. All right. The almighty dollar. What's a biggie? Pleasure. We can turn to pleasure. We need to find some joy in this life. Doesn't seem like God's providing it, so I will turn to those things that please my fallen nature. What's a biggie? Career. Okay, it could be a career. Well, anyway, we can make a list that goes on and on. Entertainment. Entertainment. Not government, yeah. But a big one is government. We look to the government to solve our problems. <clears throat> we, we're all sick. We need the government to step in. Uh, hey, whoa, somebody could attack us, so you guys need to help us. Um, <clears throat> hey, we got a lot of poor people here, so you, government, take care of them. Now, all these things that we ask of the government could be very realistically needed. But here's the point. If we begin to turn to anything but God to solve the kinds of problems we're dealing with, we fall into idolatry. When we do that, our behaviors change and God says, I, I'm sorry, but the cup of the Amorites is full. The cup of the Amorites was an expression just used to say, hey, my patience is great. It's like a cup, but when that cup fills up with the iniquity of my people, when it fills up, then judgment comes. Now, the judgment that falls to his chosen people is best known as chastening. Would somebody please, with a big voice, read from Hebrews 12, verses 5 through 11. It's a classic portion on God's love for his children and how he shows his love through chastening. Would somebody who has a big voice please read that? Uh, Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. And you have forgotten that word of encouragement that addresses you as sons. My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, and do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes everyone he accepts as a son. Endure hardship as a disciple. God is treating you as sons. For what son is not disciplined by his father? If you are not disciplined, and everyone undergoes discipline, then you are illegitimate children and not true sons. Moreover, we have all had human fathers who disciplined us, and we respected them for it. How much more should we submit to the father of our spirits and live? Our fathers disciplined us for a little while as they thought best, but God disciplines us for our good that we may share in his holiness. No discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Thank you very much. Essentially, what he's saying is, if you're a legitimate son, you get chastened. And God says, if you're a legitimate son, I chasten you because I love you. And if you are one of my sons or daughters, then this chastening is designed to produce holiness in your life and the collective life of the nation. And he says, in fact, if you're an illegitimate child, I don't do anything to you. This is a very uh, serious statement that God is making. The ones he loves, he chastens. So what does he do to those that are illegitimate sons? Well, that's all part of the day of the Lord. It's all part of the kingdom of man. God allows those who disdain him, will not honor him with respect and praise as God the king. Uh, he will let them go. David asked the question in Psalm 73, why do the wicked prosper? Why doesn't God do something? And it says in that same psalm that David, by faith, went into the temple, and then he got an answer. God will deal with them. 
That's coming later. But the sons that he loves, he deals with now. This is a loving thing that comes from our, our Lord. Chastening is what a father does because he loves his child. Now, we all have a fallen nature, so we need to be corrected from time to time. So Joel is talking about this correction. So what are the, the locusts? What do they have to do with this correction? Well, we'll find out. Israel is in trouble. And this is the reason. Unbelief turns to idolatry, which turns to lawlessness. And finally, for his loving people, it turns into chastening. Okay, now Israel was surrounded by Gentile nations, right? Part of the problem was that little tiny Israel over here on the eastern shore of the Mediterranean Sea, little tiny Israel is surrounded by large, powerful Gentile nations. If you turn in unbelief away from God, you need some other gods. What was happening was the nations began to influence Israel. And when secular nations offer a culture and a belief system to God's chosen people, then it's all downhill. Now, does this sound familiar today? The church, if this is the church, that is God's chosen people in this age, the church is to be holy. If the church turns away from a real heart love for God, this pattern emerges. And what happens when that occurs is the culture begins to influence the church. And then the church begins to look just like the culture. And then it loses its edge. And it becomes something that's not useful to God. Now, God will never throw the church out. But if the church begins to capitulate to the cultural norms, what do we know is going to happen? Chastening, Chastening will come. But why does it come? Because of what? Well, he loves us. Okay, I would say for the last 200 years uh, in Europe and in America and other Western nations, the church has been on a, a, a difficult path, but the trend line has been downhill. And pro part of that problem comes from unbelief. It's say, yeah, we believe, you know, we got the Bible, we memorize it, we study it, but yeah, but I kind of like to do the things the world does. I kind of like to get into the pleasure of life. Come on. You know, we need to make a, a, a substantial earnings through our career. My goodness, we need to trust the government. Well, all these things are true, but what if they take the place of God as king? Now we're in a state of idolatry. And <clears throat> unfortunately, the church today uh, on, a, uh, on the uh, testimony of many people who are not even part of the church, said, why would I join the church? You guys are no different than I am. Why do I want to get up on Sunday morning and go to service when you act just like I do? We've actually read testimonies from secular people that have said that. That's a terrible indictment. Okay, this is where we're going with this. Joel is addressing this problem. And actually, Joel really speaks to my heart. I think you're going to find encouragement flowing from it as well. Okay, so we got the two kingdoms, kingdom of man, kingdom of God. Because God loves his people, then he will chasten them. Now, what does he do with the kingdom of man? He doesn't deal with them now. Not <clears throat> eternally. But later, all those who have rejected him, uh, who have not taken the gospel seriously and turned away from Christ, all of them will suffer eternal judgment. So, it turns out Joel is addressing both the kingdoms, the kingdom of man and the kingdom of God. So let's jump in. 
kingdom of man is based on <clears throat> uh, a set of values that shift, vary. Uh, in other words, I got my truth. Hey, you have your truth. But in God's kingdom, there's only one truth. How would you define truth uh, as it's defined in, in the scriptures for the church in this age? Where do I find truth? In the word. Pardon? In the word. Okay, uh, but there, there's actually truth is very personal. Truth comes through relationships. So where do we find truth? I find it in the Bible, but the Bible leads me where? Christ. Christ. Please keep in mind, truth is personal. It's relational. Christ said, I am the truth. So our, our problem in every age is actually believing that God exists, that he loves us, he's the king, and the truth that we need isn't what the culture is giving us. It is precisely what the Bible gives us. But the Bible is saying, Bruce, you need to move toward Jesus. If you want to know the truth, if you want to live the truth, you want to love truth, you've got to build up your relationship with Christ. And that's precisely what Joel's hammering at. And in the end, it says that Israel will be born again in a day. Zechariah 3.9. It's an amazing thing. Right now, the Jewish people are separated from God. They've rejected the king, Jesus. They have no place to worship. They don't have a temple. They will. And that's exactly what we're looking at. We'll get to that in a moment. Okay. <clears throat> well, who is Joel? Well, he's a prophet to Judah. In your notes, I put just a few things you might be of interest in. Uh, he probably lived near Jerusalem somewhere. He was doing most of his writing in the ninth century BC. <clears throat> um, he has a short book, but it's packed with really good things. Okay. <clears throat> um, there's an extended drought that's defined in chapter one, as well as an invasion of locusts. So in chapter one, we have kind of a trailer. And if you accept it, chapter two is kind of the movie. But it moves on to chapter three. Okay, the trailer is just to get our interest. So. Joel points to the invasion of the locusts. He said, we've just gone through this drought. And now look what the locusts have done with all the vegetation that, that lived through the drought. It's all gone. So he's introducing an idea that's going to be developed more thoroughly in chapter 2. So the trailer is all about the locusts and the drought. These are really sad circumstances for the nation. But it's not sufficient that they saw this. Now, as the movie unfolds, the plot, there's a bigger problem that Israel's going to have. They're going to be invaded. Not by, by locusts, by human armies. And what the Locusts missed, the invading armies will destroy. Okay, who leads the locusts? We just read it in Proverbs. God. He is providential and he is sovereign. Those locusts never would have come into the land of Israel if he hadn't brought them in. He is totally sovereign in these affairs. Now, it tells us pretty explicitly that the invading armies, this is probably Assyria, that he's speaking of. Who leads them in? Whose armies are they? God. They are God's armies. Now, here's the picture we have. Here's the kingdom of man. And here's the kingdom of God. A small percentage of all the people that live in the kingdom of man are in the kingdom of God. As the kingdom of God absorbs the culture of the kingdom of man, then it becomes corrupt. 
And then God says, you know, I've chosen you to be separated from the kingdom. Because we know we're going to all the world and share the gospel with folks. But it does mean we don't adopt their values and beliefs. So God sends first the locusts, then he sends in the armies. Now, here's the question. Why? Why are there invaders? Why would God do that? Why does he send locusts and then these invading armies? What do you think? Discipline. Okay, discipline, chasing. But what is it he... He doesn't do anything arbitrarily. He wants a a, a result. What, what is he looking for? He wants them to turn back to him. To turn back to him. That's right. In other words, they turned away from God. Now he's trying to wake them up. Now, we need to be very much aware. It's really easy to get down on Israel and say, look at the mess they made of things. They were so foolish. But that would be terrible to point a finger at Israel and not turn it toward ourselves. Have we messed things up? We're stiff necked people, too. Pardon? We're stiff necked people, too. <laughs> we are stiff necked, stiff necked people as well. So here's the whole thing all this is a wake up call. And how does it work? Well, if the locusts come and then there's a drought associated with it, and then invading armies come, what does God think will happen to his chosen people? What is he looking for? To awaken them to what? Repentance. Restoration. Repentance. Repentance. Restoration. 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 Two wonderful words, repentance and restoration. And that's precisely why it is explained in Joel that these two things have happened. So God's purposes are always in love. And uh, I liked your comment, discipline. Uh, that's a good word. And, and grounded in God's love, that's a wonderful word. God wants us to be discipled by his son, that we become more and more like him. That we're a holy people separated unto himself to honor and glorify him. So... In chapters 1 and 2, we begin to see God carrying out his purpose to awaken the people. Now, what I'd like to focus on is just some really big ideas that come out of this. Some big lessons for us. First of all, one of the tr truths we need to deal with is God's wrath. This is a picture of it. God's wrath is coming. God said, hey, Israel, my wrath is coming. Now, it's interesting that in the book of, Reve of Romans, in chapter 9, I believe, it says, not all Israel is Israel. Not everybody who claims to be related to Abraham is a true Jew. Only those that come down through the promised line. But God is very much against those who are in opposition to him, who rebel against him. <clears throat> so God sets in the midst of the nations a little nation, and he observes the reaction of those nations and how they treat Israel. Now, he doesn't need to do this because he knows everything. It's for us. So how will Assyria treat Israel? How did Egypt treat Israel? How will tribes, the northern tribes treat them? How will Babylon treat them? How is Persia going to treat them? How is Greece going to treat them? How is Rome going to treat them? Clearly, God is allowing these nations to come up against his people so they will turn to him for strength and with uh, real faith and courage to face the enemies they've got to face. The kingdom of man provides enemies for all of us. It provides all kinds of affliction and hardship. So God wants his people to be strong, but they cannot be strong on their own. So the whole world of nations 
is against God's kingdom. Okay, so Joel is telling us God is allowing that to awaken us. Now, here's what's really neat about Joel, as far as I'm concerned. Um, <clears throat> if one is truly a child of God, that is, in our age, trusting in Christ's death and his resurrection, for cleansing, uh, for forgiveness, and for a brand new life, then all of us need to constantly be thinking about, whoa, am I drifting away? Because our natural default setting is to drift away from God. And God wants us to stay connected to him by faith. So if we begin to stray, he will send difficulty. Now, all of us in this room <clears throat> face difficulty all the time. It's coming from many different directions. Some can be very intense, some it's not so bad, but we all face it. So here's the, the question. What do we do with it? How do we think about it? How do we think about what's going on in our own nation right now? There are all kinds of things that are going on that are not right. How do we think about that? Well, one way is to get angry. That's my default setting. Of course, that doesn't do much good. But the other way to think about it is God Okay, I can see these guys aren't doing the right thing. But I think what you're trying to say is, Bruce, are you doing the right thing? Do you have the right attitudes? Do you represent me well amongst the Gentile world nations? Or are you becoming like them? Or are you taking a stand to be a witness to my holiness? So one of the things that comes out of Joel is really powerful, I think, is <clears throat> that God wants us to see ourselves correctly. So let me get Joel out, and if you'll please turn to Joel, just for a moment. In Joel chapter 2, In Joel chapter 2, God is speaking clearly to the fact that his people have erred, but he's asking them to turn to him. He's also saying he will take care of the nations. He will judge them. That isn't going to come now. That will come later. So God is saying, look, I'm revealing my wrath against sin, but I'm also revealing my love for my people. And I will extend myself in every conceivable way to encourage my people to turn to me. So the call is for all of us to turn to him. Now, we all recognize, however, that none of us will go to the doctor unless we think we're sick. <laughs> Isn't that right? I'm not going to turn to Christ unless I really know I'm a what? Sin. A sinner at heart. We all have the sin nature. Nobody's doing the Christian experience correctly. No one. Uh, we all sin. But what is the provision that God has made for us uh, concerning our sins? The cross. Pardon? The cross. The cross. And so what do I do with the cross if I'm a believer and I'm sinning? You take your sins to the Lord and confess. To confess our sins. In fact, we all, I think we all know, 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So how do I know if I'm sinning? How do I know? Well, that's the work of the Spirit. The Spirit helps me know that. He convicts of sin. But the other way is, if trouble begins to happen, and I'm not the cause of it necessarily, I didn't do anything wrong, but there sure is a lot of trouble coming. What should that remind me of? Why does God allow trouble to come to us, around us? To mold us more into his likeness, to bear character. Okay, to awaken us which when we turn to Christ for uh, 
to acknowledge who he really is, then we begin to grow in character. So trouble, the world, the world's got a lot of it, and it sends it toward God's chosen people, Israel, toward the church. Right? That trouble that I see around me should cause this response. So let's read it right here from um, <clears throat> the, uh, this would be chapter two, and I gotta find it here. Oh gosh. <laughs> Actually, I don't see it here. It's not because it's not here. It's because I don't see it. What are you looking for? Well, here's what it says. God says, do not rend your garments. Now, what does that mean? 12 and 13. 12 and 13. No, verses 12 and 13 13. in chapter 2. Yeah. Yeah. Do not rend your garments. Now, let's stop and think about this for a second. Let's suppose in the days of David, the high priest and some of the other priests are on the wall of Jerusalem and they're talking. They're just enjoying a time of fellowship. And one of them looks out across the plains beyond the valley and they see an army coming. What might the priest do to show his concern for the approach of an enemy? They actually did it. Don't rend your garments. But the priest would do that. He would tear one of his garments. It was symbolic of, oh my goodness, this is really a grievous thing. We gotta do something about this. Okay, so it was a sign that there was an inward feeling on the part of the high priest, for instance, uh, to show his concern for what was happening. Now, God is saying, hey, don't rend your garments. Instead, rend your what? Rend your heart. Okay, so Joel is all about this. Trouble comes, what should I do? I should be able to look at the eye and say, whoa, this is trouble. This is not good. My first instinct is something external. I might complain. I might lash out, just like our culture does. I may shout at people, get in their face, and God say, no. It's totally external. That isn't going to solve anything. When you see trouble coming, is this directed toward Israel or the world? Rend your heart. What in the world does that mean? To rend your heart. What is Joel talking about? What do you think? Okay. To repent. Pardon? Repent. Yeah. There is a sense of the need for repentance. So let's look at it. There are two portions in the book of Psalms, I think, that really speak to this issue. And and I think we're called to it as we live in the kingdom of God. We're going to be um, embattled from time to time by the culture around us, and so on and so forth. So we need a proper response to it. Don't rend your garments. This isn't an external thing. This is internal. This isn't my eye on, oh my goodness, look at what's happening here in Israel. Or, oh my goodness, look what's happening in the church, even though we can see all these things. What we are to direct our eye to is to our own heart. So King David has some really neat things to say that all of us would prosper from as we think about them. Would somebody read, uh, in fact, it's in your notes if you'd like to read it there. Psalm 139, verse 23. Somebody read that? Second page. Bottom. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, and see if there is any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Could you read it one more time? Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties, 
and see if there's any wicked way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. Okay, my response as a human being, when I see trouble, we got plenty of it going on in our world today, I want to complain about it, especially if it impacts me in some personal sort of way. And sometimes I want to lash out. Fortunately, God has prevented me from doing that uh, in most cases. But I feel that inner desire just to get in somebody's face and get this thing corrected. And God said, no, that's not what I'm asking. When you see the trouble coming, when things are going wrong, David says, Lord, search my heart. David isn't looking at the enemy. He's looking at himself. David isn't looking at the the ones that are coming against him. He's saying, God, how am I against you? Search me and see if there's any wicked way within. So this is an internal thing. That's, I think, summarizing what it means to rend your heart. But he also goes on in Psalm 51, a really important psalm about confessing, and has the element of repentance in it. Would somebody read it? in your notes, um, <clears throat> top of the page three there. Would somebody read that? Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. A broken and a contrite heart. There are two aspects of confession. One is attrition, and the other one is contrition. Attrition says, oh my goodness, I have really done a bad thing. And I'm confessing because I don't want to be punished for it. Contrition is God. I have sinned against you. I have displeased you. I confess that. Thank you, as you said, for the cross, which makes it possible for me to be forgiven. So attrition is, hey, I'm upset because I got caught. Contrition is God. This is a healthy thing for me to see clearly that, yeah, there are problems in the world. The kingdom of man is sure producing a lot of them. But I'm a problem. For you because of my sinfulness. So you're right, confession and repentance. But that's an internal thing. That's an internal focus. And that's what David's talking about. And that's what we need much of. So when we see coming, trouble coming, first response is, I don't like this and I'm going to deal with it. And God's saying, hey, I don't, I don't like to have this stuff coming at you, but I'm allowing it for the purpose that you will look within yourself and see that these things, you may not have caused them. You may not be the author of any of this trouble. But when you see trouble coming, you need to lament and repent. Okay, let's look at that just for a second. Recently in a sermon by Godwin Sapien Nation, he talked about this concept of Lament and repent. So the locusts have come, and God's saying, it's okay for you to grieve. You should be sad. You should weep tears over the loss of your crops. You're going to be in debt for years because of this. Lament. Let the heart be broken. It's okay. But repent. So in a sense, why is this trouble coming to Israel? Because they turned away from God. So why does trouble come to us? What's at least one reason? 
even though we don't, may not even know it. We're not living perfect lives. God is a loving Father who constantly wants us to lament the fact that things aren't going well. It's okay to grieve. But the lament should usher forth in repent. In other words, it looks like God has allowed Satan to stay in the world. Why would God let an evil being like him continue? Because he serves a real purpose to God. His mischievous, the trouble that he causes uh, at, a, at a national level, a world level, or at an individual level, is to create a situation where I say, whoa, God, I see all this bad stuff going on, but now look into my heart, reveal to me any issues that I've got that I need to get out before you. Any thoughts on this at this point? Lament and repent. Does that seem fair? World War II in Germany, trouble came. We followed this line of thinking. What did God want from the German people? Why did he let Hitler do what he did? I don't know. But that was real trouble. But if we follow the scriptures and follow the line of thinking that Joel's got, what would he have wanted? They should have lamented as they watched innocent people being killed by Hitler. But what did he want? He wanted them to what? So let's look at history just for a second. Previous to World War II, the uh, Lutheran pastors in Germany, for the most part, says, well, yes, of course, Hitler's doing some bad things. We don't really want to talk about it, but look what he's done for the economy. Oh, my goodness. He's, he's gotten us out of bankruptcy. He's really helping the nation. Come on, let's get behind him and let's see this progress continue. But there was a man that uh, you would know uh, who lived in Germany at that time. You remember who he was? Bonhoeffer. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. He was a Lutheran pastor. And he was saying to the Lutheran pastors, dear brothers in Christ, how can we allow evil to propagate itself in this nation? Where's our voice? Why are we not speaking against this? Why are we not proclaiming the good news of the God? Why are we not making a statement for God about this whole thing? Lament. Yeah, we should grieve that Hitler's doing this, but we need to repent. We need to repent. God is allowing this to awaken our souls. God was more interested in that church in one sense than he was in other aspects of that society. He wanted those leaders to repent. Did they do it? There was only a handful. They called themselves the Confessing Church, just a handful of pastors. And uh, <clears throat> Dietrich Bonhoeffer was kind of one of the leaders that continued to press before God in prayer and confessing their sin and doing what they thought they needed to do to make a statement against the evil that was hitting Germany. This is repeated everywhere. As we see trouble arising in the West, we see um, protest, evil protests, people killing people, people burning buildings, it's the evil stuff, uh, people destroying property. What should we do? We should lament. Why is God letting it happen? He could stop it. If Joel's telling us anything, it's, hey, this is the way the world operates. This is the kingdom of man doing its best. And yes, they are wrong. But I am interested in you, my chosen people. How about you, Bruce? Have you come before me to lament your own sin and to repent of it? This is the only action, I think, that is appropriate when trouble comes. It's very personal, very individual. But let's see what he goes on to say. In chapter one, I'm sorry, chapter two of Joel, in verse 25, I'll read it. I will repay you for the years of the locusts have eaten 
the great locust, the young locust, the other locust, the locust swarm. My great army that I sent among you. Who sent the locusts? God did. They have a king that helps them march in ranks. It's God. He sent him in. And he said, look, get this right, and I will. And this is where the wonderful message of Joel comes out. I will restore everything the locusts have eaten. Everything. So whatever you lost will be regained. Now here's why Joel's so important to us. We need to get this right, really. It is so easy to lament what bad people are doing in the world and ignore to lament what is happening in our own hearts, our, our wrong attitudes about things, our, our response to people. I'm as guilty as anyone. But all of it has to do with being restored. So let's look. First of all, the kingdom of God, this is the main theme. I'm sorry. The day of the Lord. Okay, the day of the Lord. It was there during the days of Joel. Well, what is the day of the Lord? The day of the Lord is God's judgment. His wrath manifested against evil. But it's always wrath plus hope. Okay, so in Joel, we have him talking about the day of the Lord. It was coming. Wrath was coming. The locusts have already been there. Now an army's coming. It's going to be wrath, God's wrath, poured out on his own people that he loves dearly. But it's always a message of hope. What the locusts have eaten, I will restore, says the Lord. So the day of the Lord has two aspects to it. Wrath and blessing. Now, we need to keep this in mind, because as we go through trouble, as Israel went through trouble, as the church in history went through trouble, it seems like, oh, my goodness, will, will the difficulties ever end? Will the trouble ever stop? Yes, of course it will. And this is the message that God wants to make to us coming out of the book of Joel. Okay, so in Joel, the day of the Lord is present. But when did the day of the Lord <clears throat> also come later. How about Babylon? Why are the choice Israelite youths being carried out of Jerusalem into Babylon? This was real trouble. Because Israel sinned grievously. This is years after Joel's time. Joel was writing in the 9th century BC, and this is the 6th century. Okay? God's wrath is being poured out upon his people. Ezekiel 8 through 10, God describes. He said, look at the idolatry. Ezekiel, come over here. Look by faith into the temple in Jerusalem. Ezekiel was in Babylon, and, but he could see in vision what was going on. And then God said, my glory will rise up from the cherubim, and then it will go over the threshold and rise up. And then it will leave the building and go up and rise up above the, the hills adjoining <clears throat> Jerusalem, and then God's glory left. God is upset with sin. God hates sin. So the day of the Lord, this was happening at the writing of, of uh, Joel, but it also prefigured what was coming. So Babylon came. Now we know that God's wrath was poured out on the Jews, but Cyrus... 70 years or so later, uh, who was king of Persia, he said, hey, let him go back to Jerusalem. Hey, here, here are all the furnishings that were taken out of the temple. Take them back, rebuild the city, rebuild your temple. Okay, somebody said, hey, AD 70, the Roman general Titus sacks Jerusalem. The day of the Lord is being prefigured again, but here's what we're looking at. The day of the Lord. These are end times. This is the 1,000 year kingdom. This is the millennium. 
millennial kingdom. This is the kingdom we're all looking for. It hasn't come. It's not going to come until Zechariah 3 9, until Israel confesses their sins. So, what's happening before the millennial kingdom? Well, just before the setup of the kingdom by Christ, who comes back from heaven to set it up, there's a rapture. Those who are dead in Christ rise first, then we which are alive, taken up to meet the Lord in the air. Now, he doesn't touch the earth here. But seven years later, after the tribulation, Christ comes back with his bride, that's us. He puts to death every one of those living enemies. Anybody that rejects his kingly rule, he puts to death. And then we know that all alive at the end, this is where Armageddon occurs, go into the 1,000-year kingdom. And if you think of that kingdom, it's kind of like a uh, what the Garden of Eden kind of pictured. It's going to be a place of no death, no sickness. It's going to be a place where sin does not rule, where Christ rules righteously over all people. The whole of the ecology of the earth is going to be restored. The oceans are going to be healed. The rivers, uh, animals will change their behavior patterns, and so on and so forth. It's really a wonderful time. All that the locusts have eaten through the centuries, dear Israel, is going to be restored to you. So we think of Job. What did Job lose? His family and his riches. His family and his riches. But at the end of Job, God says, hey, you have, you lost your family, you lost all your animals, your farm. But here, I grant to you what? Two times what you lost. All that the locusts have eaten, the Lord will restore. But here's where we are. We live in the kingdom of man. We're just a little tiny portion. We're in the kingdom of God. Okay, in the kingdom of man, the kingdom of God takes some big hits. History shows that clearly for Israel. It shows it for the church. And Israel lost a lot. They don't even have their land now. Everybody wants to take it away from them, including the United Nations. But here's the deal. It will be restored. And little Israel, the off-scouring of the earth right now, becomes the leading nation. Her king he rules the whole universe from Jerusalem. And who is his consort? Who reigns with him as co-regent? Church. We do. Okay, so when we go through trouble, and we are going through trouble, every generation has had its trouble. No matter how good things were, there's always been trouble. Trouble should remind us what? To get angry? What are the two words they rhyme? Repent. Lament and repent. and repent. So we see trouble come. We may not be the cause of the trouble, but on the other hand, collectively, is the church doing what it's supposed to? It never has done what it's supposed to. But there have been times in the history of the church when it was better situated than perhaps now. There have been some real high points. I'm thinking of Wesley in England and the revival that took place there and the correction in their culture. The gospel changes things. The gospel is what makes this possible. We are the people who to live the gospel, who to share the gospel, and we are to, in order to be able to do that, we need to rend our hearts. But we have this promise. All that the locusts have eaten, I will restore to you. So what are we looking for? Heaven on earth or heaven beyond earth? Here's our problem, and this is what we need to lament about and repent over. We want heaven on earth. I don't want any problems. I don't want higher taxes. I don't want this. I don't want that. And God's saying, okay, you live in a fallen world. You have to live with that. But what I'm interested in, Bruce, is that you rend your heart. Are you in a right relationship with me? Or are you grounded in areas of unbelief? Have you trusted me, even with all this trouble? 
or are you rebelling against the trouble and in a sense fighting against me? I allow the trouble. But my purpose is loving, so you will turn to me and lament and repent. So here's our end. The day of the Lord then starts, I would say, right here before the rapture. It ends with the burning up of the old earth, the old heavens, and then the initiation of the eternal kingdom. So this is kind of what we might say is that period of time that the day of the Lord concept is looking toward. Okay, we need to close. I like Joel. He's very honest, but he's very encouraging. So I trust you'll enjoy it too.